Good morning, Ian. Good morning, Alex. And it's a very odd one here. Uh, it's, you know, around the middle of the year and it's something like winter outside. <laughs> That's why I've got the lights on in here. <laughs> but I imagine with you it'll be hot and sunny. Yes, here it's like uh, real Spanish summer going on. <laughs> very, very good. I, I don't know why I chose to end up in this curious part of the world, but there we are. <laughs> well, you're welcome. You're very welcome to Spain. All right. Thank Chapter you. <laughs> 13, institutional, 13, yeah. institutional Science and Truth. Very important. Yeah. Yes. It's a somewhat different chapter from the others, because in the others I'm really saying what are the hemisphere correlates of different ways of thinking or appreciating the world. Whereas in this one, I'm not so heavily reliant on the hemisphere hypothesis. Um, it's really just about how much can we trust what science says, as people constantly tell us. Um, and, uh, of course, as always, my aim is not to say that we shouldn't trust science, but that we will trust it better and honour it better if we're aware of its limitations. And some of those limitations are not the ones we've talked about, which are perhaps intrinsic to um, science and to the models used by science, but are intrinsic to the fact that it's carried out by normal human beings with all their failings, their pride, their ambitions, their cunning, and so forth. So uh, that makes a difference to what we're looking at. Yes, and honoring the points we're always making about the importance of context. Of course, if we're mm. talking about science, we should talk about the context in which that science takes place. Um, Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, and you just mentioned it. We sometimes often read a claim, comma, science says, but who's that science in capital S? It, it's science. Yes. Scientists, what scientists? So um, it's important to know the difference between the different takes different scientists in different disciplines take about matters of yes. fact, quote unquote, and not to yes. think that because we can add science says, this gives kind of an unbiased truth to the statement. Yes, I think there's um, uh, two things really. One is the phrase uh, perfectly understandably and quite correctly, um, scientists do disagree about certain truths uh, or, or potential truths. Um, that's absolutely right. But there's another point, which I think is interesting, which is that because of the specialization of science, the massive specialization of science, who calls himself an expert, mm -hmm. can only be an expert in a fairly small area. I mean, a really very small area. And a, a, an area that to the layman w would be... Um, uh, surprising because it's not we're not just talking about the various different branches of sciences like microbiology and so on but really whether you specialize in some very particular issue to do with them now the trouble with that um, is that when even a very good scientist talks about what science says unless he's talking about the very bit of science that he's a specialist in um, he's taking it on trust, in fact, on authority, and much more so uh, everyone else. When we say science says, what we mean is we've been told somewhere in something we read that X is the case. And uh, I, I think it's worth pointing out because it's often said that, you know, in, in other areas of life and notoriously in, in the world of spirituality and religion, we take things on authority. Uh, although actually um, people are perfectly well able to examine their own experience there, just as scientists are. But it's not just in such areas that we take things on authority. Science is largely such a case. And so we need to think about the, um, the, the, the worthiness of that authority. In some cases it will be uh, absolutely trustworthy, in other cases it may not be. Yes, indeed. It's the show, don't tell mantra but then one realizes that one needs um, to trust yes. who is saying what and then trust exactly. brings us into issues of community 
and mm. also the flaws, the inherent flaws, and mm. maybe the particular flaws of any community. Um, yes, that's right. Yes. Mm. So you and mentioned I stress it, again. I just want to stress that I'm, I'm, I'm not saying there's something wrong um, mm. with this. I'm just alerting people to the fact that it is the case that science, when we say science says, we are almost always. Um, unless we are a world expert in one very small area and we're only talking about that very small area, we are effectively speaking from authority, not from anything yes. that we would normally think of as scientific. Yeah. Yes, and to, and to make it clear, now at the beginning again, and probably we, we say it in the end, the fact, and you write it in different ways in this chapter, the fact that one articulates the limits of the very enterprise one belongs to, it doesn't mean yes. that you are against that enterprise and to point no, no. the limits of science that sounds obvious but needs to be this preface needs to be injected you know yes. <laughs> recurrently yes pointing the limits of That's... science is anything but being anti-scientific actually yes it's trying to um make the the status of science uh, put it on a firm footing, not on mm. a kind of uh, footing that it is is easily kicked away from under it. And of course, I myself am enormously, enormously dependent on science in exactly the way I'm describing. And at the end of the chapter, I, I make some remarks about, well, where does that leave me as a scientist writing about science? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you mentioned specialization as one of the elements as you write, of, mm. of science being victim of its own success, right? And before mm. we move to others, I wanted to briefly dwell on this distinction you mean you, you make between specialists and generalists, and this funny mm. observation that generalists obviously welcome the specialists because they draw on their material, mm. but mm. but specialists maybe not so much. They don't may not yes. value the work of generalists. Yeah so much and, and your book is a great example of going to the details but also sewing them together in a kind of great synthesis so it's commuting between these two poles yes, i hope so and i think they're both important but as you say the generalist can see the point of the specialist but the specialist can't often see the point of the generalist even though um <clears throat> the, as threading as the whole point of doing the science in a specialized area is to be able to answer the big questions um so uh, arnold toynbee who was himself a polymath makes this rather nice uh distinction um he makes two good points actually one is that he says that we need both the flies eye view and the birds eye view which mm. is really what we're saying and interestingly, of course, I should say in passing that I have often said and will continue to say, because it's true, the hemisphere seems to be aware of the need as the left hemisphere does, but the left hemisphere is not aware of the need for what the right hemisphere mm. does because it doesn't see, see so much. Mm. Um, and the other image I like in Toynbee is this image of the Japanese house, you know? Yes. So that instead, yes. instead of there being rigid compartments in science, um, it should be possible to be able to move these the edges of these compartments around in a rather fluid way yes. as you can um, change the inner construction of a Japanese house. I think that's lovely because in a way we need the, the structure that gives divisions and they're necessary and, and don't have to be, but it's also important to be able to unite them at times. So it's this, again, the coming together of union and division. And this is a good segue to move from the specialization aspect to the bureaucratic aspect, or the bureaucratic, um, in a way, structure that then becomes a bureaucratic state of mind in science, yes. where, well, if you're yes. studying this phenomenon under the discipline, don't go downstairs, literally, where there's no department, physically, and don't go there mentally either. Yes, yes. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I quote William James saying that uh, most great enterprises, by the very fact that they need somehow to be administered, fall prey to the very things that they, in origin, were trying to avoid. Mm. And, and uh, you know, some science may be an example of that, that, that the way in which it's administered and, and the way in which it's talked about as well uh, is does in fact betray quite a few of the sort of left hemisphere propensities. Um, when I say talked about, I mean the impenetrability 
uh, of <clears throat> the language in which many <clears throat> scientific papers are, um, are written. And people might say, well, you know, that's, that's a necessary concomitant of science. Of course, it has to have this specialized jargon. And it, of course, there is some truth in that argument. But it's fascinating to me that between its founding in 1844 or whenever it was, um, and 1970, the the language in uh, in Nature and in the Scientific American, by the way, um, was at the level of difficulty posed by an ordinary English language newspaper. So right through till um, you know times I can remember, like the 1970s, um, an, an averagely well-educated person ought to be able to pick up a scientific paper <clears throat> and, largely speaking, be able to understand it. But that since the turn of the millennium, the difficulty in nature has gone up to a, a, a measure something like 30, 30 something, mm -hmm. uh, whereas it was 0, 0.0 in, um, in my lifetime. So it, it's an extraordinary change and not a welcome one. I mean, I find that you get so much more interest out of reading papers written up till about the 1990s in the areas I'm familiar with, because they seem to be written by a human being for another human being. Mm. But now they often appear to be written by a machine for another machine. And they're full of acronyms. Um, they're, the, the language is extraordinarily dense and contorted. And all the sort of human element has been effaced and it's this extraordinary idea that we do better science as long as we pretend we're not really human beings looking at other human beings. <laughs> uh, well, and we could dwell on some kind of entertaining aspects of it, but not, not very long in the fact that there have been some papers re written by machines that have, have actually made it to journals. But that's more like the entertaining hoax business of, you know, mocking the oh, system's we holes. <laughs> We must, we must come on to that uh, shortly, yes. Uh, yeah. But before that, you make a distinction, and I always like your, your distinctions, your precisions. Um, well, no, because we've discussed precise is to cut, be, to cut before, <laughs> let's say. I used to say precise, but now I'm also... Accur in, accuracy. Yes, I'm mending my vocabulary here. But you make this distinction, <laughs> I do, yeah, this, between yeah. dissemination and exposition of ideas with respect to journals. Yes. And this, this also has to do with books and the fact that well i'm not here i'm not based on any statistics at hand but that we read we and when we say read it's perhaps the general population but certainly academics and certainly students we read less and less books and more and more specialized papers and also mm. we don't write books and so there's kind of a the figure the more romantic figure of of this kind of um, generalist, but also specialist scientists working alone within an institution mm. or not that writes long mm. monographs. This is getting mm. this is getting lost um, towards yes. more and more fragmentation. Um, maybe it's yes, inevitable. That's, that's... Maybe it's inevitable, but at the same time, that well, we should well, balance. I we should balance both tendencies, probably. Uh, well, ideally, I absolutely agree. We should. I don't think it's inevitable. I mean, I make the point that, largely speaking, the influence of um, great scientific giants like Einstein, Darwin and Freud um, w was through the books that they wrote rather than just through individual papers. Um, and uh, much the same can be said of, of philosophers, that it's their books rather than individual papers mm -hmm. that seem to be important. But, of course, in writing a book, the, you are actually connecting what you're saying, you're expounding it at length into a picture that makes sense rather than just giving a nugget of, of information. And you are helping to relate what you're doing to a broader field. But the, the reason I think it's not inevitable but is a feature of the way science is now practiced is that to write a book takes a long time. I mean, I speak from experience. <laughs> and if I, if I had <laughs> depended on, on, on a um, payment from a, a university faculty during the time I was researching, I would have to have kept producing small papers all the time. That would have impeded the ability to write a, a long book, which requires fallow periods in which nothing very much may be coming forth, yes. but stuff is nonetheless gestating. Um, and uh, the other thing I think is the pernicious effect of 
various um, measurements of impact of the pieces that you write, which depends on the journals in which they're published uh, and uh, how many people read them and so on. Whereas um, if you write a book, it has no impact factor, if you see what I mean. It may have a vast impact in real life, mm -hmm. but there is no IF being measured <laughs> in, by the scientific machine. And so what counts is to write an enormous number of papers saying almost exactly the same thing. And um, some scientists uh, themselves um, amusingly refer to the process of salami slicing, in which mm. you, you don't give the whole thing, but you give tiny bits of it serially. Mm. And this makes it look like you've done an enormous amount more work than would have been the case if you presented things as a whole. Yes. This is, as I said, an unfortunate accident. I don't want to so mm. far um, suggest there's evil in it, like just say there's stupidity, but it's an unfortunate accident mm. that by by librarians have, wanting to have a simple metrics to assess mm. um, journals, this end up percolating mm. into how we assess scientists themselves. And then this is how exactly. universities hire scientists now. Because, and, and this is a strange wheel where, and, and I've also said it and wrote it in the past, and of course that doesn't make many friends, but that in a way we enter this rad race where we want to publish in high impact factors mm. so that we can apply for grants so that we can get money so that we can buy expensive machines so that we can generate data so that we can publish <laughs> again in this in these high impact <laughs> factor journals and yes. all of that because of some simple things that went slightly wrong and now they're in the whole culture of, of scientific mm. institutions Yes, and, and that illustrates another point that's a very broad point that goes even outside science, that very often I think where there's a tendency for people to think there is um, uh, some kind of very cunning plot uh, being hatched, that actually the people who are running, as it were, the scam are themselves the victims of the same situations. I say about management administration, it's not yeah. like they're evil geniuses who yeah. are sort of trying to control mm. us. They are themselves controlled by the machine they made. It's a sort of Frankenstein's monster. Mm. That's, that's an interesting point. We all, in a way, well, I'll qualify that, but we all lose. We all lose. Um, we do lose, yes, 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 exactly. Not all, because there's a lot of money being made. And, and that would have to do with a more, <laughs> with a more political or economical critique of maybe f deeper causes of all of that. But that would perhaps yes. take us far away from the rich material that's in this chapter. But there's also an aspect that has to do, in my view, with, with universities and academia having merged in a weird hybrid with corp mm. corp the corporate world. And so we don't really know what we're doing as a university. Are we a business with kind of measures that every three months we need to share with the administrators? Yeah. Or are we these kind of yes. pursuers of, of wisdom in a way detached from the concrete constraints of the world? And this hybrid is rather Frankensteinian as well, in my view. Yes, yes, you, you're mm. entirely right, Alex, yes. Mm. It is a worrying factor. And, and we'll talk about the way in which economics... Um, plays into this mess when we come to talk about the the, the journals and how they uh, select some of the people that they publish. So should we move, move on to this section in your chapter it's entitled How Reliable is Scientific Evidence? There you, mm. you put forth some examples that are very pertinent to the book itself. You talk about neuroimaging, for instance, as a way to know what's going on in the minds and in the brains of people. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, I talk broadly about issues like replicability and so on, and no doubt we'll talk about them, but there are a few points to be made about neuroimaging specifically, um, that, because it concerns me so, uh, so closely that I just want to make. Um, that we, we, there's a sort of seductive idea uh, which is uh, promulgated by the publication of beautiful many colored images of a brain. Um, you could almost hang them on the wall. Uh, and, and what one appears to be able to see is the brain in action doing whatever it is. This is a terribly simple idea and it's misguided. Um, 
the, the, let, let me say, there are a whole host of reasons why this is not straightforward. I mean, look, looking at the, um, the, the picture, for example, um, you see only tiny peaks of activity, and what you see depends on the level at which you set the threshold um, for uh, in the scan. So that, it, it, obviously, if you set the threshold very low, you'll see activity in the brain all the time everywhere, which is not very helpful. But the alternative is, as um, Elkanon Goldberg has put it, that it's rather like Noah trying to um, imagine and deduce the landscape of Mesopotamia after the Great Flood by seeing two or three peaks sticking up out of the water. Mm. Um, and uh, there's a whole host of reasons why even that is not straightforward. The first is that it's difficult to know what one's seeing is inhibition or activation. So uh, each of them may show up as lighting up on the scan. Um, uh, uh, related to this is that the more effortless it is for the brain to carry out a particular task, the less you will see anything lighting up, um, less effort shows lower activity. So if you ask a bit of the brain that is not used to doing something to solve a problem, it will light up very brightly because it's having to make a great effort. But that doesn't mean that that is the place that is best equipped to be carrying out the task. And, and aside to this, uh, people with higher IQ have lower activity showing in the brain. And people, obviously, conversely, with lower IQ show higher levels. So this is a, a, an area of constant uh, confusion. Added to which, whether an area is decreased or increased in activity or is in fact just normal in its activity, it doesn't tell you whether it is involved. So an area that doesn't show up because it's exact, because it's normal, as it were, may be importantly active. And areas that are decreased or increased, you can't simply deduce from that that they are important and straightforward. Everything in the scan depends on interpretation. So it's not a, a kind of um, wonderfully objective, squeaky clean way of seeing what's going on in the brain. Mm. Uh, added to which there's some things that are very concerning for somebody like me who's interested in looking at uh, the hemispherics of what um, which is that very largely diffuse areas of activity may be terribly important, far more important than any very small localised area. But because the small localised area is persistent, it shows up as important on the scan, whereas the very large diffusely connected areas that come and go, as it were, um, don't show up. And I give the analogy of supposing that you were trying to work out uh, what goes on under the, the bonnet of a car, what is the important bit? Uh, if you scan the activity, all the things that are really important um, <clears throat> involving gears and so on may not show up as doing very much at any one moment in time. The one thing that will always be present when the car is switched on is the fan. But the fan has nothing whatever to do with mm. the propelling of the car. Mm. So uh, often something that is not central to what you're looking at turns up as vital. And the thing that is really important is so diffuse and covers such a large area that it doesn't relatively show up. Mm. And then you have the fact that um, often an area may show great activity, but because it's a relay station, not because it's the area that is actually doing what it is we're interested in. For example, the basal ganglia are hubs uh, which show activity when areas in the cortex are active, but in a way they are secondary to the areas of cortex that are of primary interest to us in relation to what we're, we're looking at. Yes. You know, and, and then there are other things, um, such as the fact that we're always, when we're looking at a scanner, looking at a very strange situation, and strange situations alter the brain function. Changes, very small changes, experimental conditions can lead to quite large changes in the patterns of regional metabolic activity.
Um, and so small differences in the way in which a task is presented or set up may make a large difference to the results. Yes. As may um, whether or not you have men or women, uh, handedness makes a difference and race and age are also known to make differences. So, uh, and one of the things that's fascinating is that occasionally men and women turn out to be using um, opposite sides, as it were, of the brain in doing a certain task. And if you have 50% men and 50% women, and one group is activating the left hemisphere and the other is activating the right hemisphere, it will se seem as though there's nothing of interest somebody researching the hemispheres going on at all, because mm. it comes out 50-50. But in mm. fact, something very important is going on. It just doesn't show up because of the aggregation of data. And all these aspects sound and are technical and also epistemic and very important but one may mm. ask one may ask well but why are they in the context of this discussion about institutions and, and i think zooming out a little bit is like these fallacies of localization for instance this kind of mm. neo phrenology and these fallacies of interpretation like that seems like the data is talking to you and um, are sometimes highly selected and so they become kind of fads and fashions and then a lot of noise and yes. good papers, but also a lot of noise is, is published around them always yes. at the expense maybe of other ways to inquire about the brain in this, in this case that are down, down selected. And I, I thought, I, I thought it was very revealing to me, mm. the note you make in this respect, when it comes to case reports, because we've seen in part yeah. one, how mm. absolutely fascinating and enlightening these case reports are. But you're right that because it's not so easy to refer to them and cite them, and mm. because they're not offering maybe a method that hundreds or thousands of scientists can use, but maybe some points to discuss some rather specific aspects, mm. that, they, that, that then they're not cited and then they, they even can get lost uh, in the literature. And, and part of your work um, has been mm. to fish them back and bring them back yes. into, into context and into the awareness. Yes, yes, that's right. What, what, I, what I think you're referring to there is um, deficit literature based on injuries, strokes and tumours and so forth. And every um, way of looking at the brain has its limitations, and I uh, talk a bit about that uh, in relation to the deficit literature. But generally speaking, I think the deficit literature is very much more reliable than the scanning literature. And I therefore say that scanning literature should always, where possible, be an accompaniment to looking at the brain from other um, other uh, other ways, looking at using other methods, and, and one of the points that's been about scanning um, uh, and there's some force in it, is that uh, when the machine has gathered its data in uh, the, the MRI scanner or whatever it is, uh, the data are then put through various um, statistical packages which make up to 100,000 comparisons. And of course, if you make an enormous number of comparisons, a number of them will come up looking significant just by chance. And so it's been suggested that this actually invalidates um, the results of you know 20 years or more of, of imaging. I, I don't believe it does, and I say why I don't think it does. I don't think the situation's as bad as that and allowances are made for it by intelligent researchers. But nonetheless, potentially it's a, a problem. Whereas when one, what is lovely is that when one looks at deficit literature, nowadays we can actually experimentally suppress areas. We don't have to wait to have a stroke as well. Um, we can find out a good deal about the, um, the places in the brain where certain kinds of activity come about. So my overall message is, uh, what a surprise that we should use as many ways of looking at the brain as is possible rather than become fixated on one of them. Yes, what a surprise that we need hammers and screwdrivers to do different things. <laughs> this is quite a good one, yes. Yeah, well, there is a point before we move to replication because this, this, mm. this comment you made about packages and, and maybe phishing um, results where they're not there. But before that, there's mm. an also at least to me, a very interesting point you made make about localization by citing 
uh, Huglings Jackson from 1874. And, and this quote is lovely. It should be stamped in, in, in all neuroscience labs. It's to locate the damage which destroys speech and to locate speech are two different things. Again, yes. very yes. obvious, but non-trivial. And even when you have, yes. um, you know, deficit and localization in this way, it doesn't mean you're localizing um, speech or whatever mental construct you're looking for. Um, Whenever you're looking at a complex system that has a number of parts and it's, as it were, relayed between parts, you can't necessarily assume that the, the bit you're looking at is the mm. crucial one, which mm. is really a point um, I made earlier. But that's why we need to make many comparisons and many kinds of studies. Yes. I mean, it just reminds me of genetics and, you know, when, when ah, people found the yes. gene for, well, you know, if I can <laughs> turn it off and turn it on and the thing appears or disappears, yeah. it must be that love was in that mm. genetic sequence. But it's a complex <laughs> system, so... It was probably yes. there and everywhere else too, or in many other places at the same time. Yes, and in our last session, we talked about the ways in which you simply can't jump from a gene to a certain kind of yes. uh, action or result. Yeah. So let's move to replication. And maybe, yes. let's start very simple, because I realized by reading this that we know it's very important, but maybe to some readers or listeners, they may mm. need to be, again, explain why, if you find the results with all the proper methods and even the scientific mm. method in place in a lab, for it to mm. count as a scientific result, and that, that comes from Boyle um, many years yes, ago, yes. this needs yes. to be now shown somewhere else that it's mm. not your lab. And it's, that's not because mm. we don't trust you. You may have done everything correctly, but replicability is the stamp that the phenomenon you found in a way, still holds a scientific. Then it could be shown not to be the case and so on. But that may not come as, as, as that obvious, that you need to show it somewhere else too. Yes, that's right. And um, we're talking about reliability in a way that we can rely on this result. And it, it's really very hard to rely on a single result. Or, but it's a, a um, like everything else, it's a gradual process. It's not a black or white process. Something um, becomes more reliable as it's replicated more. And it doesn't necessarily become less reliable if sometimes it is not found, because we know that... Um, life is not cut and dried in this way. So somebody may try to do the same experiment and not get a result. But that in itself doesn't say that the first one was wrong. It just casts quite a big question mark and suggests that we need to do more research. So um, being able to find um, that you can't replicate a result is every bit as important as showing that you can replicate a result. And yet there's something sexier uh, if I may put it that way, about finding a positive result, which mm. means that positive results tend to be um, published more than negative results. Mm. So often people replicate something or fail to replicate it, if you see what I mean. They do the same procedure but don't get the same result. Uh, but that can be um, stuck away in a drawer somewhere and never yes. be brought to light. So, And yet it's very, very important. One of the things I, I was shocked to read but not altogether surprised was that in the old Soviet Union, and and I think in China up until very recently, um, it was impossible to find negative results published in the literature. Always there were positive findings. And of course, that in itself skews what you're looking at. Yes. And as we'll see in a moment, the causes for that can be very, very mundane. Like well, yes. journals want positive results. So if you go fishing and come with no fish, the community doesn't <laughs> want to hear that that area may not be a good one to find fish, although maybe there are other creatures there to fish, or, or although that's yes. probably a piece of knowledge that we should, we should all know, but because it doesn't give yes. you a manuscript published, yeah. then yes. you're not selecting for those, or at least you may find them, but you're not going to tell, because what's the point of spending all this effort in telling people that you didn't find? It sounds like a failure story, that these failure yes. stories are part of the success of science. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, an interesting small point that I hadn't anticipated, um, I, I knew that when you tried to replicate published results, um, that the, the, the rate was 
around 60% in general. And I found that it was 40% in psychology, but 10% in cancer biology. And and that surprised me. I suppose what happens there is people are always looking for something that will be a a cure, and so rush to publish it. And then someone else comes along and has a look at it and says, well, we didn't find that. It, it, It is an interesting area. And again, that's not a... It, not in any sense to disrespect science, as I think we've both been saying, um, it's in science's favour. And, and it's in a, a great deal to the credit of science that one of the most cited papers in science is Ioannidis' uh, study that has the title um, Most Published Findings Are False. Yeah. I, I can't, that's not exactly the title, but that's effectively what it is. Yes. Yeah. So it's a good sign. It's a, it's a sign of health or at least pursuit of health within science itself, that, 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 that there have been actually recently over the last decade or so, maybe two decades, a lot of meta-science studies, scientists studying mm. what scientists do and how they do it. Uh, mm. it's, it's being very beneficial, although it reveals all these shadow aspects, all these dark aspects that mm. go from, as you put it, as you put it with, with Miss Demon Gnomes, I didn't know that work, with minor wrongdoings, right? It goes from minor wrongdoings <laughs> all the way to fraud. But it's good to yeah. bring some light into this because that's the way yeah. if science is self-correcting, it's also self-correcting at this meta level, not just at the level of tiny protocols in labs that don't work, at this level of how we yes. proceed. Mm. Yes, and the research into um, in science his own practices and the things that scientists report uh, about their own practices and those of their colleagues is mm. is fascinating and very revealing. Mm. Let me mention a, something that's related to replication, but it's not quite mm. that. It's not replicability, but reproducibility, which sometimes can be mm-hmm. confounded. And it, it's maybe a minor point, given, given the many things you write mm. in this chapter, but there's because we are using more and more expensive techniques and um, mm. that means that and and that means that too often what another lab could not even run the experiment because true the expertise and the technology i mean if you think of mm. cern that's the, the most incredible example well you're yes. and, and you're not gonna have 20 particle accelerators <laughs> all over the world and i'm sure they're doing a great job but there's something to be yeah. said about us writing down how we do things and the possibility of as many labs as possible mm. to be able to at least try to reproduce those results yes. and then replicate. Yes. I, I just felt yes. um, I had to yes. mention that briefly because it, because sometimes it's not that, again, it's not that obvious that, that that's available. No, it's a very good point, Alex. And there's uh, so much research depends increasingly on rare and very expensive um, setups of uh, apparatus, we can't necessarily rely on it being easy to reproduce um, mm. an experiment. Mm. That's quite right. Yes. Mm. Um, now, a big point that, that comes from all of this, which I think it's also the beginning of your chapter and towards the end, and it's very important again, is that, well, when, you, when we point to these limitations, some, some may say, well, we're either talking about kind of these minor wrongdoings, and that's fine. And in a way, who cares? I mean, we mm. know we're not perfect. Mm. Or bl- that will be black or white. Or we're talking about cases of fraud, and these you have everywhere. Mm. And when mm. we caught them, they're punished as they should. But that's not mm. really science. But this, this mm. craving is not, again, black or white in the sense that mm that in pointing the limits of science, they should not be easily dismissed as either like hardcore corruption or just some some um, ingenious errors. There's a whole spectra of mm. <laughs> misdoings that, well, yes. are hard to exercise, I would say. Yes, there's both the fact that um, there is a range from, from minor misdemeanors, as you say, uh, which might be simply leaving out things that don't quite fit, but you don't know what to do with them, um, but really ought to be reported nonetheless, uh, to outright um, uh, fabrication of results. And there are some stunning examples uh, emanating even from very respectable 
uh, scientific institutions, and I, I, I talk about those there. But the other thing that you touched on is really the way in which um, to react to this. And I'm afraid that quite a lot of science just takes it as um, somebody who's anti-science or science bashing to bring up these points and that really um, we should ignore them and just say, well, science is always doing a, a very good job. Uh, I think that's the wrong response. I think the response is to take it very seriously um, and to see what it is we can do to uh, minimise these bad effects. What those things are is, of course, very interesting because there's a whole area to do with publication. Maybe we should talk about that a bit. You know, how things get selected to be published, the nature of journals that are now predatory, yes. and uh, so how do we know whether we can rely on a certain finding? And so yes. See, I think a lot, a lot of people have this idea that... Um, Somebody does a research, they then send it to the editor of a journal who then picks somebody who is the perfect person to review this and there is a, 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 um, a fair judgment made and then the thing either gets published or not. But even <clears throat> before we come on to predatory journals, um, th there are many problems here. As Richard Smith, who was the uh, editor of the BMJ for a long time, said, who actually is... The perfect reviewer is this person um, somebody who is in your field and is equivalently knowledgeable in which case they're a direct competitor with you mm. and mm. it's certainly not unknown for a reviewer to press an article to give them more time to produce their results first or, or simply to um, in certain cases simply to pitch the ideas um, and, and write them up as one's own. I mean, there's some st staggering examples of that there. But also, um, people are over-influenced by big names and big institutions. And one thing that everyone should know about is um, uh, the study done by Peters and Sisi, uh, where they took, um, I think it was... I don't remember how many, but it was it was a sizable number, uh, about eighteen or, or or more papers that had been published in reputable journals, had them retyped and put under names that were made up names, from uh, institutions with names like the Plains Center for Human Diversity or something like this, <clears throat> and they were sent in to the same journals, mm -hmm. and I think it was only one or two cases in which the journal actually noted that this was something that they'd already published. Um, in almost every case, it was sent to reviewers, and I think only one out of the, whatever it was, number of papers was accepted as worthy of review. All the others were said to have uh, huge mistakes, made it not even worth rewriting the paper or asking the person to revisit their data. It was just impossible that this could be worth publishing. And that, don't forget, these are all papers that had already been published in those journals. That is a fascinating finding. Yes, there is a fascinating ecology of conflict of interests and confusion that it's sometimes revealed Maybe it makes headlines because it's spectacular, but sometimes you reveal when, when somebody decides yeah. to do this kind of cheeky um, probing on the system. But we, I want to say we, it's well, all of some of us who are engaged directly in, in writing manuscripts and sending them and so on, we leave this every day and it's very normal. And at the same time, you could say, well, that's human nature. Yes, but if we're, if we're describing how reliable science is and we believe that science is one of the most reliable paths to truth then all of those things yes. should be very present because as you're saying it's not like this this um very idealized scenario where you're just thinking in your lab and then you you write it down and it goes to somewhere where people are very unbiased and then very quickly mm. they point to the flaws they even like the idea that they may even caught caught catch the flaws i mean when you review yes. somebody else's paper it's, it's often more emotional in the sense of, well, what is yes. the person saying and how is that stressing beliefs in the field and not so much as, mm. as policing the very potential flaws. So, so the idea that peer review is, is this kind of mm. laundering, in the good sense, machine that will mm. just retain the dirt and just polish it. Well, 
yes. it can work yes. and many people are still for gatekeeping but this brings forth mm -hmm. many sociological questions as to what's the best, the best way to actually do it if we are scientific about it because this gatekeeping doesn't always work and that's kind of a general statement doesn't always work that that's right and leading into this is uh, an issue we talked about before which is the the complexifying of the way in which results are presented mm -hmm. um, makes it by that very fact um, less transparent to yes. a reviewer who may not yes. have the time to go through every single detail. Yeah. And there, there are a couple of things there. One is the fascinating uh, finding that reliability and replicability of results seems to be lower in the high impact journals like Nature and Science than it is in some of the smaller journals. And the explanation for this, given by Flint and Munafo, is that. Um, somebody makes a, a, a breakthrough of a newsworthy kind. We found the gene for depression. Mm. We found mm. the gene for schizophrenia. Yes. And yes. This, this gets published immediately in one of the big journals. Yes. And then um, a couple of months later, a, um, a couple of studies that are much use much bigger data sets fail to replicate this entirely. And they are not published in the big journals. Uh, they're published in the small journals. And there's a knock-on effect for the public, which is these big, uh, high-profile journals with a big finding make the headlines in, in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in your daily newspaper, you find, mm -hmm. oh, scientists have found. So, but the retractions that need to happen later are not publicised. So we, we get a, a skewed uh, picture of what's going on there. <clears throat> yes, and, you know, we can make this joke. If you publish a paper whose title is something like the brain region for infidelity has been mapped and found, you know, everybody <laughs> wants to click and read it. But if you would submit something that says, well, but things are more complex, it's like, oh, come on, don't, don't bring this, you know, nuance here. Yeah. I mean, we, we just want yeah. things that are disruptive. And, and then we start using all these words, you know, cutting edge and disruptive. Yes. But because we've been over and over saying that this matters, the matter with things. <laughs> is complex yeah, that's right. and subtle and then subtle but the question is then whether subtle and complex statements are well yeah. they may be not summarizable in a tweet or in a headline and so they get less publicity yes. and in a world where this is important more than ever and they go down the list and others go up the list and this selection skews the whole the whole ship the whole big ship yes. towards some places and not no, others no. That, that's right and, and on the issue of whether or not flaws will be picked up by reviewers, there is a staggering example of a sting uh, set up by some scientists that submitted a paper in the area of um, chemistry, which they say anybody who A-level chemistry, that's the sort of thing in this country that people do around the age 17 or 18 at school, should be able to see that this is flawed. And it was sent to 300 journals and um, half of them accepted to publish it and uh, there were only a few cases out of the 300 and something in which people pointed to there being some reasons for scepticism but half of those nonetheless accepted to go ahead and publish the paper anyway and it was from a man whose name was very obviously made up something um, from an institute of science that didn't exist it, it, is, it is extraordinary what goes on Yes. But even it, more extraordinary is deliberate uh, gaming of the system, which perhaps we should talk about a bit. Yeah, so again, it goes with the full range because you can have predatory journals or conferences, as you also put some instances <laughs> yes. in the book. That would, uh, and this happens to me relatively often. You get these obviously <laughs> spammed emails that says doctor, yes. and then sometimes your name is double repeated, Gomez Gomez, and then they say, <laughs> and given your expertise in, and the font is big and different, so it's clearly copied, yes. copied and paste, <laughs> we'd be thrilled if, you know, given your expertise in whatever neuroscience, you, you would participate in the International Journal of Neurology of whatever in university. Yes. This sounds yes. funny, but, but some people mm. would, you know, go along and even pay and, and go or that's the same for journals and then end up having mm. all these papers like tens of papers published in, in these nonsense journals the same thing happens at the other side of the spectrum i would say like mm. I, I i think it's rather 
And I think, uh, a shame uh, uh, that, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I think that in order to make sense of what you've just been talking about, we need to first set the scene for those who don't know about it. Um, the, the, the idea of um, uh, 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 journals being open to the reader without uh, open access. Mm. So um, the way publishing worked uh, until quite recently was that um, <clears throat> somebody who was um, uh, doing good research would send it to a journal, and the way the journal paid for itself was by <clears throat> library subscriptions and in some cases particular individuals subscribing so that the reader paid. And <clears throat> then came along this idea, which in itself sounds attractive, of open access, which means the reader doesn't have to pay. But the journal still has to be paid for. So how is it paid for? It's paid for by the person who wants the paper published, that may be that individual or the institution they belong to. Now, the trouble with this is it's obviously open to corruption to such an extent <clears throat> that there are many completely bogus journals that with, have very respectable names. I, I, I list some of the names. I can't remember them off the top of my head. But if I read those names, I'd think, well, surely this is a very respectable journal. And they are entirely predatory. In other words, what they do is they send the spamming emails that you and I get which are, uh, they really ought to get somebody who, <clears throat> in my case, knows the English language slightly better. And it's obviously written by a, a, a rather good, um, you know, English-speaking Chinese person, but, but nonetheless, uh, uh, who are looking for um, contributions because uh, there's, there's a kind of unholy alliance. The, the, the researcher needs to be published in order to be promoted, and that researcher can simply pay to be published and can pay a whole lot of journals to publish a whole lot of articles, and thereby appears to be an enormously prolific and um, accepted scientist. So this is a very, very big problem. Yes. And uh, Jeffrey Beale, who uh, he published a thing in Nature, actually, about this, uh, which I quote in there about uh, he is a, a librarian at an American university and he raised this point and he found that he had no um, no friends in, in fighting this battle in that the universities uh, wanted it hushed up as well. Partly I suppose because it might backfire on them and make them look like they weren't as um, astute as, as they'd like to think. But also because they in turn want to be able to keep certain students and certain uh, academics, and that if you make things more difficult for them, they may lose income. So once money gets into the business of science, which unfortunately is the nature of things, then the openings for corruption are extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. several things here. I mean, I'm, I'm getting fired up because these topics... <laughs> but there's a tweet mm. that circulated around, which is hilarious, and it's a snapshot of... Uh, the actual website from Nature, um, and the title is called The Growing Inaccessibility of Science. And then right beneath it, it says access options. And then it says rent or buy the article, which is, I mean, it's something psychedelic. <laughs> well, it's, it's nearly, it's $8.99. And to subscribe to the journal is $199. This in a paper that's discussing the growing, in, the growing inaccessibility of science published in Nature, right? So. It's it's yeah. it's Monty Python level. <laughs> you, I mean, these yeah. things you, you well, could you could they could be used straight away as scripts for good comic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. I, I, we, we can mention a few that really are. I, I think the thing about that though is that somebody has got to pay for it sooner or later. I mean, a journal has to be paid, and if it's not paid by the writer of the article, which immediately opens the door to corruption because there's a perverse incentive for the journal to publish the paper if the paper will pay them money to do so. And there's a perverse incentive for the academic. But if the, the only alternative to that is for pay for access. So it's perhaps slightly unfair to pillory nature for <laughs> saying this, although I agree it's quite a funny juxtaposition. But people have had enormous fun with this process. And uh, there are a couple that are worthy of reporting. Uh, one is... Um, a, I think a Swiss uh, cyberneticist called Cyril Labbe, who invented a scientist and used a computer that can generate papers that sound like science speak. 
mm. to generate a whole lot of papers, which then got published. And he invented this author of the papers, who, who he called I Can't Care, Ike Aunt Care, which is presumably a, a pun for the English-speaking <laughs> reader. Um, and so prolific was Ike Aunt Care with these nonsense articles published in highly respectable journals run by outfits like Springer Verlag, one of the great, one would have thought, prestigious science publishers in the world, that he became the 21st most published scientist in the world, and yet he didn't exist, and none of the papers he wrote meant anything, yeah. which is really lovely. Yes. But one of the things I, I, I like best is, is um, a, a, I think, um, an IT specialist from Australia called Peter Van Pugh, who was so fed up with getting the emails, the predatory emails that you and I get, asking him to... Um, uh, they put him on a list for publicity purposes. They kept sending him things, please uh, submit your article to our journal. And so he decided, um, in, in a, a moment of genius, to write an article of seven pages, which simply consisted of the sentence, take me off your fucking mailing list, repeated mm -hmm. over and over mm -hmm. again. And the title of the piece, guess what, is take me off your fucking mailing list. And it even contains a wonderful diagram <laughs> that looks like a sort of flow diagram in which the words take me off your fucking mailing list is put out on the page like a scientific diagram. Yes. And he was staggered to find that not only did they not take him off their fucking mailing list, but they said his paper had been accepted for publication. And they asked him just to make a few tweaks to, to um, what was it? Yes, to, to, to add some more recent reference. <laughs> so that's obviously a knee-jerk reaction by a journal without even looking at it. Just add a few more recent uh, uh, references. And a request to pay, um, which of course he didn't. Yes, L let me just here add, maybe this, this may cut the humorous aspect of it. I I'm a bit, in my thinking, a bit less polite mm. and more Mm. cynical about this whole thing because mm. when you mention predator and on web people mention these predatory journals i think really the big predators are not if we made an image with the with the natural world like these moths or locusts that are funny it's are these lions and tigers and these lions are tigers are really big big publishing corporations and i publish in them and it's important for me to get the papers there so in a way mm. i'm not 100 percent preaching with the example but when you're saying somebody has to pay for it, well, the mm. taxpayers pay for it. With, I mean, the taxpayers pay for the work of scientists, the, the salaries and, and the machines and mm -hmm. so on. But then we scientists review for free the manuscripts. Yes. And then yes. we, after having paid for our research and doing it for free, and when I say for free, I mean with our time paid, by, whose salaries are paid by the taxpayers, then we further use money from the taxpayers to pay the publication <laughs> fees to these <laughs> journals that, as you said, yes. they co-opted the beautiful idea of open access. And now it's called gold open access, which means uh, because we know that your institutions want to look great and say you're dis yes. disseminating your results and they're not behind a paywall, no problem. We'll remove the paywall, but here's like 4,000 more euros per article. So now there's some, some important journals that in a way these glam journals that are gonna charge you ten thousand dollars ten thousand dollars to publish one study i mean this is preposterous but because you need those again to be able to yes. make your cv look powerful enough to be hired yeah. i mean the whole scheme so i'm just yeah. coming back to this to say yes and, and i'm not against companies and uh, making money mm. but the question is mm. how much money they make yeah, and out yes, of yes. and who's paying for that? Uh, it's it's as yes. close to a scam as it gets, and well, that's how I see it, and it makes me a bit angry yes. because we, in a way we there, there are ways out. You can say, well, I'm not going to do it, but if yes. if you have stu students and I do, mm. well, they need that, otherwise they're going to be out of the system, out of the institutional mm. science. So mm. it's it's funny. It yeah. can be made funny, but it's also terrible in some respect. No, you're absolutely right that there's a very serious point there. Um, uh, I, I, I knew, of course, all the, all the things you're talking about, but I didn't know the extent 
of the sums sometimes demanded, $10,000. Yes. That is extraordinary. I didn't know that. But obviously, as soon as there are people in the system who are paying these large sums for it, yes. it corrupts the whole system for somebody yes. else who doesn't wish to pay, but yes. is an honourable scientist. Yes. Um, and you raised the question of um, giving your time for nothing in reviewing papers, and that is also worth talking about. How important is this, um, is this God, which it is, of peer review? And again, Richard Smith, who is himself a scientist and was the, for many years the editor of one of the world's best known scientific journals, the BMJ, uh, himself researched the question of how effective peer review was and in fact um, suggested that the system should be wound down. Um, why should it be wound down? For two reasons uh, in brief, but the detail is, is itself very interesting that effectively it doesn't do a good job of selecting the right papers. So papers that shouldn't have been accepted are, and papers that were um, very important get rejected. And he says it's rather like a black box in which your paper goes in and a roulette wheel is spun and a result comes out, which means either your career is made or broken. Um, but the other side of it is the amount of time that is devoted to this by people doing peer review, because don't forget, with an explosion of a publication, there must be an explosion of peer review, and this takes scientists away from their own work in order possibly to do a good job of reviewing, but most probably not because they're short of time and because they're open to the usual human corruptions. But it's also interesting that until about the 1930s or 40s, Peer review was not part of the publication process. And interestingly, Einstein published many uh, articles, but was only once told that his article would be sent for peer review, and he immediately withdrew it. Uh, not because he thought there was anything wrong with it, because he simply didn't agree with this idea um, that somebody else would pontificate about whether his <laughs> science was worth publishing or not. So what could be put in its place? And uh, he makes a very sensible suggestion that the editors of journals uh, can sit in a committee on papers and make decisions of their own. And he said, uh, papers that are missed by them will certainly be taken up by another journal. And if a paper turns out to be controversial, the journal will benefit by publishing some of the retorts and reposts to the original piece. And the system will work at least as well as the current one. Perhaps it's worth mentioning this little fantasy by Zillard, who, who, who suggests that a scientist um, <clears throat> is frozen um, before death and then wakes up 300 years uh, ahead and realises that most of the science being done is, is nonsense and there's far too much of it being done, and that, by the way, he doesn't understand it. And so he sets up a foundation um, for the prevention of the advancement of science. <laughs> And basically what this is, is exactly like what happens now, that um, prestigious scientists spend all their time going to conferences in order to network with editors of journals that may publish their works, sit on committee to, committees, committees to award, um, yes, whether a piece is re reviewed and published, but also um, prizes, and that by doing this they effectively mean that these worthy scientists will have no time to further yes. their own work, yes. and that the young will feel it very important simply to fit in with the ideas of their elders, which is already a stifling factor. Yes. I have seen this very, very clearly. Um, and, and interestingly, it, it, it's, it's the stifling effect of elders that nobody really wants to, to publish a paper that rocks the boat is um, evidenced by research that shows that in the period after the death of a prominent scientist in an area, there is a sudden uh, fertile period of publication of a much broader nature. Yes. No, I mean, these thought experiments, again, are material for multi-Python, and yet they're, 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 actually, <laughs> they're actually happening as, mm. as, they're, as they're imagined, they're happening like that. And with respect to this quote, is it by Planck, right? Well, sometimes it's glossed as science advance, mm. one funeral at a time, right? Yes. I, I think it's worse than that. In, in this, I'm also pessimistic mm. because 
if only, if only it was that, that perhaps was from an era where scientists were their own labs in a way. And so, well, once this mm. big head, this influence passed away, but now, now they're more like armies. And so you, you have these huge laboratories. I'm talking, talking more about, sure, the biological sciences, but in any case, you have these big laboratories and then you have these students who will become postdocs, who then will become some of them, actually a few of them, their own, their own principal investigators. So in a way, you create a school of thought. And hmm. so even when you die, that, that trend will continue. And I'm saying it should, it should die immediately, but hmm. I, I see it even harder today to change these directions because the whole system is, is, is entangled in this way that this permeates through time. And, and so yes. as you also write down at the end uh, of this chapter, those who step out of line pay a really huge price. I mean, the price mm. is, mm. can be intellectual, mm. you know, heresy and, and, and out of the mm. system. Mm. And they're not heard apart from all avenues, which are probably as yes. valuable, um, if not more. So again, it goes beyond a mm. funeral at the time. It's many funerals. I yes. never seem, some ideas never seem to get self-corrected. <laughs> well, your, your comparison uh, with sects, religious sects, doctrinal groupings, um, is a perfectly legitimate one implied in your notion of heresy. Mm. That first of all, when you are a new researcher, um, you, you're offered to research on a project that's being done by one of the most prestigious figures in the institution. Uh, there's a little aside here from my personal experience. Um, before I studied medicine, which I did 10 years later in life than most people, so I was a, quote, mature student, um, I, I'd been obviously a highly academic animal. <laughs> and when I got to the Maudsley Hospital um, in London, which is um, probably by common consent the leading academic institution uh, uh, and uh, not just academic but clinical institution in the world of psychiatry in, in Britain, um, I went to the Institute of Psychiatry, which is associated with the Maudsley, to start some research. And I was, uh, I had a conversation with a, a, a very nice person who said, well, what would you like to research? And I said, well, I'm interested in how children develop a sense of time. And um, because I'm, you know, basically a, a philosophical being, <laughs> and I'm interested in these questions that are about the, the most fundamental things. And this person's eyes sort of glazed over. And then they said, come and clone the P450 receptor. <clears throat> I said, I, I don't really want, to, thank you for the offer, but I don't really want to clone the P450 receptor. So this is really what happens. You fit into the machine at a low level in a project which is nothing to do with what fires your interest. And then you work your way up. I mean, the end of that story, of course, is that I decided I'd have to become my own boss, which I effectively have been for most of my working life. But... Um, the, the, the problem is that as you begin to gain a foothold and you publish and people know your name, there's much less likelihood that you're going to suddenly embrace a new idea, which may be in the face of what your colleagues believe and may be something that <clears throat> is not generally believed by the mainstream in science. And once you get to the top, it's even less likely. You'd think that these people were now grand enough to be able to risk saying some of the more unorthodox things. But you forget that at this point in their career, they're just about to get a knighthood or a great award, and they don't want to jeopardize this. So they are even less likely to make any unorthodox changes. So you get these fossilized channels in which the same thing is just repeated in an almost mindless way. I mean, science can truly be mindless. I'm not saying, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not saying it's done by uh, people without intelligence, of course not, but what I'm saying is that it doesn't have philosophical integrity. Mm -hmm. and, and I would just like to recommend to any person watching or listening the wonderful book by Erwin Chargaff called Heraclitean Fire. Mm -hmm. um, Chargaff was an important 
biochemist who discovered what are now known as Chargaff's rules, which enabled um, Crick and Watson to go on and um, make the discovery of the structure of the DNA helix. Um, but he, he wrote easily the most interesting, imaginative and philosophically deep critique of modern science that I've ever read. And I, I found it electrifying, and I quote quite a bit of it in, in different parts of the book. Thank you for sharing this one too, yes. This is a, a in, in ending maybe, this is a good segue, at least for me, to ask you about etymology again, because you, you, do, uh-huh. so, you do so in this chapter. I love when you do that. And you speak about the meanings of the word proof and the meanings of the word trial. Um, uh, so yes, say, say yes. So, and then also about experience okay. and, and the part that... Uh, oh, yes. yes. This is lovely. This okay. is lovely. Okay, yes. Well, um, we may have talked a bit about truth um, in our session on chapter 10 about what is truth, uh, in which I, I mentioned this idea that etymologically it's related to both trust and troth, in other words, allegiances, um, rather than um, some simple fact that's out there that's to be achieved. In other words, it's a coming into attunement of one's mind with some aspect of reality. And that is a kind of an encounter, an approach, in some senses almost a dance in which to two elements that each have their sort of um, important contributions to this bond come to make that bond. Um, On the word trial, yes, it's lovely that the word um, has two meanings in English. Um, It it can mean uh, giving something a go, you know, let's give it a trial. Let's see what happens if we, we do this. But there's also a trial in law which is where a judge makes a finding of fact that this person is guilty or is not guilty. Mm. And again, when we're uh, trying out things, are we trying them in the sense of bringing them before a court of law where you apply a dogmatic set of rules and uh, uh, find this idea wanting or or to be um, affirmed? Or are we doing... see what, um, what comes about? And the word proof... Uh, is also involved in this because a proof can mean either a fixed outcome, uh, so we've proved it, so this is something that cannot be gainsaid, it it has an an irresistible force. And then there is the proof, which is um, in publishing in English, we say when the publisher has set things up and has not yet put the book into production, you are sent what are called proofs which are an attempt to you know, print it, you have a look at it, you make corrections, and, and then it is uh, finally published. So the proof is a trial run. And in English we say, <clears throat> the proof of the pudding is in the eating. In other words, the, the proof, not in a mathematical sense, but the proof through experience. And that takes me to the, the point about experience, um, which I think, if I remember this rightly, comes from... Um, an Indo-European, uh, uh, Proto-Indo-European root, uh, peri, which is um, the root also of our word peril, meaning danger, and is uh, the root also through Grimm's law, the P becomes an F, the German Gefahr, which is danger again. So experience is something in which you risk something before life, before the world. You, you put yourself out there you experience and it is an intrinsically risky business and then I quote I think Blake's wonderful thing about my mother groaned my father wept into the dangerous world I leapt I think that's so beautiful in this era in which we are absolutely um, immobilized by fear that something will not be safe, that we will not be safe, that we simply protect ourselves against experience mm. by our fear of anything that might uh, expose us to risk. Exactly. And now maybe the final comment on this to link it back to the hemispheres hypothesis is that you write, we need to regain the strengths of the right hemispheres antifragile idea of truth and proof. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, that is, um, I think, one way of putting it, which brings into play um, Taleb's idea of 
I think, very important idea of anti-fragility rather than mm. robustness. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Well, that's been fascinating, Ian. And good, good. Maybe we could end here. Yes, I'm sure we could um, talk for a lot longer, but yes. I, I think this is very good, very good length to talk for. Thank you very much, Alex. Yeah. Thank you again. Wonderful discussing these things with you. And thank you for having so, written this. Well, let's just say to the listeners, read the book. It's much better. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more in it. <laughs> thank you very much, Alex. Okay. Thank you.